blessed with Eduardo and, and Jocelyn, um, missionaries to um, a country that we can't maybe shouldn't tell you about. But they were telling us that if we would come to this country in uh -huh. Africa, that they would sit for four hours and listen to Curtis and not leave. I, and they have uncomfortable chairs. Like terrible. And no bathroom. Okay, that would be a problem. <laughs> and they would sit for four hours. No drinking. So I, I guess I'm just saying we don't have too much tenacity here. <laughs> That's all I'm saying in that. I'm done. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you see me jumping right in, don't you? I'm done. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us to gather together in this place. Father, I thank you for this place. I thank you that your words are spilling forth. Uh, it's just a, a, amazing. It's not unbelievable. It's just amazing. Because if we believe in you, so it is believable. And it is amazing how far your word is being spread from this simple place. Father, I thank you for the opportunity you've given us to share your word according to our understanding. Chad, that was Chad said he was going well, to do that. to go through the cross. Amen. Yeah. 
I'm going to say it this way. The blood touches everything. This guy knew the word and he knew it well. And I like that. It's, it's, it's rare that you get to talk to someone who knows the word like he did. But he hadn't made the process of taking things through the cross. The emphasis in his heart was still sin and law. And as long as law is focused on you identifying your sin and what you did wrong, you're not seeing what Jesus did right. Because it's his righteousness. It's not that we're free from the, that we can just go off and sin, but I'm free from the guilt of the law that's going to cause me to sin again. I'm free from the bondage of the law, of the law for righteousness. The old covenant is the law for righteousness. The new covenant is the law of righteousness. Does everybody understand that? You need to understand that because there's, there's conflict. You know, Jesus talked about uh, obeying the law here and disobeying the law is sin. And, but over here, it, it, there's another scripture that Jesus says that the Holy Spirit's going to convict the world of sin, and that sin is unbelief in God, unbelief in Jesus. It's unbelief. Because I believe all sin comes from unbelief, but, you know, and so I, you have to, the, the, it literally says, read the book of Romans, read the book of Galatians, read the book of Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians. Uh, you, if you're going to live under the old covenant, you have to almost eliminate all of Paul's writings. Do you understand that? You can't, you can't morph them together because Paul is saying, people say this all the time, and this was brought up, you know, it says, well, what about James? Where it says, uh, faith without works is what? And I ask people that all the time. I, I said, faith without works is, and everybody goes, well, how come you don't say righteousness? Yeah, because in Romans 4, verse 5, it says faith without works is righteousness. And the book of Galatians says faith without works is righteousness. But we don't quote that, do we? See, the book of James is written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, to the Jewish listeners. And the book of Galatians and the book of Romans is written to Gentiles and to some Jews that were amongst the Gentiles. But we need to understand that that when you read scripture, you have to take everything, even what Jesus said, through the cross. Jesus, there's people out there that say, well, it's in red letters, I believe it, and I follow it. Well, show me your hands. If you show me your hands and you still have them, you're not following the red letters. If you walked in here being able to see without a C and I dog, you're not following the red letters, because it says that your eyes have made you bucket out. In red letters. <laughs> if we're a hand of things, you cut it off. You're not following red letters. See, there were things that he said that were under the old, during the time period of the old covenant. And then there were things that he had said that were under the new covenant. Mountain of transfer. Some people know this, the mount, most people know it's the mountain of transfiguration. That what took place there, Jesus told the disciples, don't tell anybody about this event. That's kind of strange, isn't it? But don't tell anybody about this event until he's risen from the grave. So that's in another time period, another covenant. So Moses and Elijah represented one covenant. Jesus represents another covenant. And so we just need to understand that everything will help you. Anytime you come with a dilemma on Scripture, just take it through the cross. Was there circumcision in the Old Covenant? Say yes. yes. Is there circumcision in the New Covenant? Yes. Once in the flesh and once of the heart. Was there righteousness in the Old Covenant? Yes, self-righteousness. Take it to the cross. What is it now? 
Christ's righteousness. Was there law in the Old Covenant? Yes. Were there commandments in the Old Covenant? Yes. Are there commandments and laws in the New Covenant? Yes. Was there a mark of the covenant in the Old Covenant? Yes. Is there a mark of the covenant in the New Covenant? Yes. It's you. You are the you carry the manifest presence of God with you, just like is in the ark in the old covenant. Everything has to go through the cross. It will just help you understand maybe some things that are you hear one person say this, and another person say this, and they both it's both scriptural. But how do you put them together when they seem opposite? Take it through the cross. Amen? Amen. All right. Enough of that. We were going to talk more about that, but that's just a, maybe that'll get it off my heart and we can, we can go from there. And uh, anyway, I have lots of people that have the same questions and comments that this young man had uh, over throughout history that have asked questions and made statements, and but they void all the book of Romans, Galatians, Ephesians. Philippians, Colossians. And they just, and it's fine, you know what? If you can choose to live that way, but just don't think that that way you live makes you righteous. Because Jesus makes you righteous. There's even a scripture in the book of Revelations, those that follow the commandments of God and have faith in Jesus. In other words, they, their lifestyle was the Jewish lifestyle. But they still had faith in Jesus. In other words, their righteousness came from their faith in Jesus, but they lived according to the Jewish law. And that's okay. But their righteousness came from Jesus. Amen? All right. Amen. Let's get into this. Today is a really a cool day, and we don't... Uh, I used to always say I would never teach according or preach according to the calendar. I always needed that. Well, it's, it's this day... But that, that was the, uh, uh, what I call a, the American calendar, you know. Well, I don't mind preaching or teaching according to the Jewish calendar because it it's already passed. Uh, we've just in, ended the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, it's called in Hebrew. And uh, uh, we've shared on this before. We've learned a little bit more information. Remember I shared that, that it just seems like every year, uh, when we start teaching on these things, God will just give us a little, another puzzle to stack on top of the other puzzle pieces to make it clearer and more interesting. And, uh, how many people remember us talking about the Day of Atonement before? Raise your hand if you have. Remember, yes. remember that's with the two goats. You have the goat of the Lord, and you have the scapegoat, or the Azazel, and uh so we're going to share that because we're on Facebook Live and there's some people out here that want to hear that again. Uh, but what we need to understand is on the 10th day of Tishri, which we just started the 11th day of Tishri, at, or they did over there in Israel. Because right? their day starts at night. Anyway, anyway. Yeah. And evening and morning was the first day. But this is the season. Of the, on the 10th day of Tishri, uh, the Day of Atonement begins. And, and during that day, let me, let me set the stage for you. And you've got to get this through your head. Don't think it's Jerusalem as being this little bitty uh, town with just a few Christians. Uh, historians say that there was approximately 350,000 people living in Jerusalem. Uh, and not just living in Jerusalem, but people would come. There were two traveling uh, feasts that they traveled to Jerusalem for to celebrate. One was Passover and the other was the Day of Atonement. If you could make it, you would travel, walk, ride a donkey, uh, take the express, whatever, you know. You would come to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover and the Day of Atonement. Now, some of the things that take place whenever they sacrifice uh, or, or perform what the priests do in the temple are the same whether it's the Day of Atonement or whether it's Passover. They go through some of the same things. The Bible in Levitic, Leviticus chapter 16, if you want me to put that on the board, verse 6. And it just shows you here that 
this is what it tells uh, basically. It, it doesn't give us much, uh, and I, I, I call it doesn't give us much, but the, the Talmud and the Mishnah uh, give us a whole lot more understanding of the feast that the children of Israel uh, performed yearly. And I don't get bored talking about this, even though I did it last year and the year before that and the year before that and the year before that and the year before that, because they, they've been doing it for thousands of years. <laughs> These are things that we need to remember, even though we're not Jewish. Remember, uh, I, I think it is in, in, in is it Second Corinthians chapter, uh, hold on a second. It says all these things were done as 11, 11 verse. No, it's first Corinthians 10, 11. Now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Got a question? Anybody in here think we might be close? To the end of the ages? Well, okay. Even if you don't think we're like on the brink, we're a whole lot closer than Paul was. Okay. We're a whole lot closer. The signs of the time are clear. If you can't understand the signs of the time, poof. Anyway. So this is written for us. This is written for Gentiles and people that read God's word. This is written for us to understand the things that happened to them just didn't happen to them. They're written down for so we could learn and understand. And that's why I have no problem teaching and, and uh, uh, in, in accordance with and align with the Jewish calendar and the feast. Because this is powerful. This is the day of atonement every year. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of people would show up in Jerusalem to celebrate this feast. And this feast was, uh, it, was a, it was in a conjunction with another feast, but on this one day, they, everybody would just be quiet. They, they would just, there would just be a hush. You'd have 300, you'd have all these, these people and all this energy. And they were to focus primarily on uh, not what someone else did wrong, not what someone else said wrong, and what, not what someone else didn't do, but what someone else did, but they were to focus on what they did wrong, individually. It was a time of self-examination. It was a time for them to bring up their regrets, bring up their failures, bring up their faults, and bring them before their face and look at them. And... Uh, they're just called regrets. The things that, you know, whether it was through sin or just where they missed the mark or they didn't treat someone right, they were to bring these stuff up. Maybe they, they responded to somebody wrongly. They were to bring this up once a year on the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement, but they knew what was going to happen at the end of the Day of Atonement. And so they were all there to get a, what was called a do-over, a mulligan, a second chance, a third chance, a uh, and this is under the law. Even under the law, what you're going to see here is so powerful uh, because most Christians only recognize half of the Day of Atonement. Uh, most Christians only live in half of what it really represents. And that's the goat of the Lord. There was two goats that were chosen. And... Uh, Lots were cast, and one, one goat would be the goat of the Lord, and one goat would be the Azazel. Say Azazel. 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 The goat of the Lord uh, would be taken into the tabernacle, and it would be, uh, go through a five-step process. Five is the number of grace, not that that's a, but uh, five is the number of grace, and it would go through a five-step process of being sacrificed. The first thing that would happen the priest would lay his hands on the, the goat of the Lord and it would transfer the sins of the Jewish nation onto that goat. Oh, that's cool. And it, the goat would carry all the sins. Would, and see, that's, that's, see, this is where the understanding of laying on of hands ministry is. 
for someone's anointed uh, or ordained in the ministry, uh, the presbytery or the elders who, who ordained them lay their hands on them and bless them with a blessing and transfer the authority or the anointing that's on them in them. So, uh, so the first thing they do, they lay on their hand, lay hands on the the head of the goat, transfer the sins of the goat in, or of the Jewish people into the goat, and then they would Gethsemane is the second step. So that's what's called Gethsemane. Now you've heard that phrase before, the Garden of what? Gethsemane. Gethsemane. What was the Garden of Gethsemane? The Garden of Gethsemane was an olive grove. It was a place for an olive press. It's where they press the oil out of the olives. And Gethsemane literally means to press. Where did Jesus go before he was crucified to pray? Garden of Gethsemane. What was happening to him? He was being what? Pressed. Pressed. You know, it was a pressing that was taking place. Uh, what we need to understand here is that uh, that they, the, the priests were literally squeezing and pressing the sins into the goat. And the third thing, they cut the throat of the, 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 the goat and that would, uh, as soon as they would get done cutting the throat of the goat, they would say, it is finished. Now, I can't help but stop and bring up these other things that take place at Calvary. Because the same things that were happening on the Day of Atonement was happening when they sacrificed the Passover lamb. This, and I really believe, like some other people believe, at the same exact moment when the priest cut the throat of the Passover lamb, uh, and he said, it is finished. That Jesus hanging on the cross said, it is finished. At the exact moment in time, that's just the way our God is. Yeah. You know, it's just amazing. When, when you go back and look at all these, not similarities, all these exact representations, uh, this, the scripture tells us that Jesus, six days before the uh, before Passover had his feet anointed with oil. Guess what? Six days before the Passover, the Passover lamb is inspected and its feet is anointed with oil. Mm -hmm. Then it says two days before the Passover that Jesus' head is being anointed with oil. Guess what? Two days before the Passover, the Passover lamb is finished being inspected and its head is being anointed with oil. These similarities, not similarities, these exact representations. Jesus was the final sacrifice for them. Jesus was the Passover lamb. He was the priest. He was everything all in one. It's just, he, it's just amazing when you get into this. Um, now, everything that happened to the past, to the, the, the goat of the Lord happened inside, uh, inside the tabernacle and the temple. Inside, so... Uh, no one could see it, but they knew what was happening. Just like salvation is for us. See, Jesus shed his blood for us. I love what I said when Jesus hanging on the cross. He said, it is finished. finished. Now, he didn't say I am. He said it is. Yeah. Something came to an end when Jesus said, it is finished. And, uh, and so what we need to understand, too, is that that when Jesus said it is finished, the old covenant came to an end and the new covenant began. And all this took place inside the private surroundings of the temple. Just like salvation for us, when you believe in the blood of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us, is something has taken place on the what? On the inside. But this is really where I have, this is where we need to walk, this is how we walk in victory. We need to understand and recognize the spiritual significance of what's taking place on the inside. But yet, that's not the, the rest of the story. The rest of the story is there's an escape goat. There's another goat being sacrificed that mirrors the one on the inside that's done in public that everybody can see. And that is taking care of these regrets and these failures and the, 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 the things they wish they would have, could have, would have done. You know, the do-overs. See, it's... See, Salvation is just not what's taking place on the inside, but it's how you live fresh and anew every day on the inside, on the outside. It's how, how are people looking at you this next year? 
Hey, next week, when you when, when you see the same people you saw last week, are you carrying the same unforgiveness that you carried all last week toward them? Are they seeing it, or, or have you released that? Have you let it go? And I love this about the Jewish culture because what they do when they hear a story and read a story or, or read scripture, they put themselves in every aspect of the story. They see themselves from all the different angles of the story. It's just not about them being forgiven, them having a, a do-over, their regrets being taken away, which we'll get more into that. But it's about, are, are, you, are you forgiving other people? Are you letting other people's past? But listen, as we get into the story, you'll find out that there's a point in the time. The scapegoat is sent out. And one year, the scapegoat, with all the regrets, all the sins, all the stuff, this is something they see. That it is sent out. It's not killed, but it's sent out to the wilderness to die. One year, it came back. It came back. And everybody's like, ah! You know, the scapegoat kind of came back. And so they took it out and threw it off a cliff. And, and the the, the Talmud tells us that from that point on, they took the goat out and threw it off a cliff so it would make sure it could never come back. <laughs> and because within that goat, that goat represented all the sin, the regret, the failures, the disappointments from that past year. And that's where we get the, you know, the, the matter of fact, the, the, the phrase Azazel, the name Azazel, Azazel has two meanings. One of the meanings is take him away. And the other one is the, the, the weapon in the hand of the enemy. So what this is saying is that now if, if, if your goat comes back that has your past attached to it, embedded in it, pressed into it, <laughs> well, what, what, how do we relate that today? You ever been around somebody you hadn't seen in a couple of years and all of a sudden you see them, they, they, they start talking about stuff the way you used to be and what you used to did and, and, and the used to and the used to and the used to and the would have could have and you wish no one would have known about it, especially if you put it on Facebook because now everybody does, you know what I'm saying? Especially if they put it on Facebook. See, even if someone brings it up, we're sh we should be free from that because if we let that affect us, someone's got our goat. You ever heard the phrase, don't let someone get your goat? Yeah. That's where this comes back. Because it's the weapon in the hand of the enemy. All the enemy has to do is bring your past up. And see, but if you're free from your past, it's not going to bother you. Yep. See, on the Day of Atonement, what makes this day so powerful for the Jewish people is they're free from it, and they know it. On this day, they're free from it. What is really cool about this is that They'll, they'll sit there and they'll, they'll lay their hands on the head of the scapegoat, the Azazel, and they transfer, people can see the priest doing this, they transfer the sins, and everybody says, yep, there goes all my sins, there goes all my regrets, there goes everything I've ever done wrong this last year. How, and they're quiet. Remember, they're all quiet. And, uh, uh, and then they reach around and they squeeze the goat, they go through Gethsemane and they squeeze them in so, it can't, the, you know, so the sins can't fall off. But the Azazel, instead of having its throat cut, it, a red cord is taken and wrapped around its horns. And now, if, if a story doesn't come up to mind, I'll make sure it does. Anybody know the story of Abraham and his son, and he was going to sacrifice his son? Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, we need to understand that, that, that it's not our God to tell people to go kill their kids. But the idea here is that that was what was normal at the time. That was normal uh, for people to sacrifice their firstborn male child in the culture of the time. It's called the historical arc. If you don't understand his, the historical arc, how things changed throughout history and the way they were, you can't look. One thing, you can't look with today's understanding and, and today's time, look back and judge that time with our understanding today because they lived in a different part of history. Things were different. So God, this should, this should speak to somebody, God came in to what was normally believed. You hear that? Someone can believe something absolutely wrong and God's not scared to come into that, use that, but to bring that to him a revelation of what he's provided. So right before... He was going to bring the knife down. What did God do?
Jehovah Jireh, my what? Provider. He provided a what? A goat. A ram. That's a male goat with horns. And he pulled him out of the bush. What kind of bush? Thorn. Thorn bush. A non-burning one. Non-burning. <laughs> Too bad he could have had some. Too bad. He pulled him out of the thorn, came out of the thorn, and can't you see a bunch of thorns wrapped around its horns and bleeding from being in the bush? It was stuck. It had been fighting. But God provided a, a ram of horns. I mean, it was like, can't you see? Okay, now. Yeah. Hear, hear this right. Can't you see Jesus? Now, who, who placed the crown of thorns on Jesus' head on Passover? It wasn't the Jews, it was the Romans. So the, the priest never touched his head. If, if, if the Jews would, the priest would have touched Jesus' head, they would have transferred the sins of just the Jewish people. But because Rome was, was the, represented the people of the whole world, they transferred the sins of the whole world onto the head of, the, the head of Jesus. It's just a beautiful picture. Yep. So you have a crown of thorns and it's red and it's bleeding. And so the Azazel, they take this cord and they wrap it around the horns of the Azazel and they lead this Azazel away. But before he goes away, they cut a piece of the, the cord off and they put it on the door post, not the door post, the hand, door handles of the temple door. Now everybody's watching this. There's one priest that stands, there's a chair there, and there's one priest that stands by the temple door and he puts the cord there. Uh, you, you know the, the scripture that your sins are scarlet, but they're white as yeah. snow? This is what we're about ready to tell you is where that comes from, is that there's a miracle that takes place once a year and it has always taken place up until a certain time. The cord would literally turn white. Wow. That would be a miracle. It's happened every year up until... And the best way I can put it is there's a series of histories written down in all kinds of manuscripts. Does everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. uh, the Jews have what is called, the, the Hebrews have what is called the Talmud. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Babylonians, which are before the Jews and during the time of Jews, have what's called the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, and it records history. In the Babylonian Talmud, uh, it is written and mentioned in there that in AD 70, you know what happened in AD 70, right? The destruction of the temple, right? That 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the cord never turned white again. Whoa. Coolness, huh? Yeah. Now, so it would have been about 40, the time of. If you, if, I'm not going to tell you all this. You can look it up. When you find out when Jesus was born, mm -hmm. and then go back 30 years from AD 70, wow. once Jesus was paid the price for our atonement, that system never worked again. Even though they kept trying to do it, it never turned white again. That's just history. I think it's cool history, though. And so they would send this goat out. They, a person would be charging and lead it out, and it was supposed to die. It would usually die out in the wilderness. And one day it came walking back. One time it came walking back in, and everybody freaked out. And, and then they'd start throwing it off the cliff so it would never come back. And then everybody's attention would look up at this cord. Where are you getting these pictures from? <laughs> I've never seen like, No wonder it was like, huh? I know. <laughs> they're not. Look at the picture. Put that back up there. I want to see that goat. <laughs> I thought they would have done head to tail. Looks like they're dancing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One last dance. See what you missed when you teach. I don't, no, I don't get to see this stuff. Word. <laughs> that looks like they're dancing. <laughs> anyway, so you have three or three or fifty thousand people all focused on this cord. 
this red scarf. I don't have that. I don't have that picture. <laughs> I don't have that one. And everybody, you put out, remember, everybody's quiet. Every, there's a hush. But you can feel the energy because they know what's going to happen. They know they want to see that cord go from red because that means, see, when the priest is up there and he sees that cord go from red to white, he does one thing. He sits down. Because that meant that God accepted that the meant sacrifice. That that God accepted the atoning sacrifice for their sin. So not only was their internal salvation paid for, but also a new beginning, a new a fresh, not so they can go out and do it again, so they can overcome it and live better and walk better and act better. See, it's all about how you see, it's all about us getting, see, if you're always guilty about what you've done, you always keep doing what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. But if you're free from it, it gives you another chance not to do it again. Yeah. Without guilt, right. without shame. Yeah. And the, uh, She has a question. I mean, how, how, many, how many times do you hear or read scriptures, like in the book of Hebrews, where it says, and Jesus sat down at the right hand. Because he's our high priest. And he sat down because he saw the Father accept his blood for all of our sins and sacrifice. I mean, he, paid, he just didn't pay the price for us to, to, to be born from above, but he paid the price for us to have a do-over every time we fail. We have a fresh start. And we don't have to wait once a year. We can get up the next morning and do different. I have people all the time saying, says, well, I still have the same problem. I said, well, let me ask you a question. How long has it been? I don't care what the problem is. I said, how long has it been since you've done, had this problem? Well, it's not as bad as it used to be. I go, aha! Mm -hmm. See? See, if you were doing it for whatever it is, like every week, you were losing your temper every week. Being angry and mad and frustrated, and now you're losing your temper once a month. That's growth. That's progress. That that's a journey. That you're running a race. It, it doesn't happen overnight. Some of these things. Listen. Some of the way we are in life, we learn from our our mom and our daddy, and our mom and our daddy learn from their mom and our daddy. You think you're going to get over it in, in a week because you heard scripture? Sure. <laughs> It'd be nice. And some people do get delivered from alcohol day one. Yeah. But most people get to walk it out. Have to walk that sucker out. So the priest then didn't get to sit down any anymore after the cord didn't turn white? What? No. So when the priest did that, they didn't get to sit down anymore once the cord stopped turning white, right? Right. Well, he sat down when the cord turned no, white. No, but right. after, after Jesus, it didn't when it stopped white. turning no. white, the priest never oh, no, they would never, oh, that, that, no, they would never, they couldn't sit down until it turned white. Wow. And see, that's another thing we need to realize. There's so much information about the Jewish culture that really just speaks volumes to us if we understand the Jewish culture. And the, like the furniture in the temple. The furniture in the temple, does anybody know what the, what, what the furniture is? There's an altar. A labor, table, table showbread, altar of incense, candlesticks, the menorah, curtain. There's a curtain there. Is there a chair? Wait a minute. No chair. Wait a minute, no chair. There's no place to sit down. <laughs> there's, there's no place to rest. Work is always being done in the old covenant. There's no place to rest. So where was the chair? Outside the door there? That would have been outside, yeah. The big, out there. Okay, I should ask this question way back well, that's right. when we started. <laughs> but when they were saying it is finished, at the same time God was saying it is finished, did they know that's what God was saying? No. They had no clue. No. What's really cool about all that is some of the information we've gleaned over the years is that uh, during the Passover now, uh, and that's what you're talking about. During the Passover, they would have a, I wish we had a, do you have a picture of the, the temple? They would have a, 
uh, a priest with a shofar go to the highest point of the temple in the corner because you know there are two I mean Passover is like Passover okay and he would be he'd be able to look down and see what's going on and he'd be able to hear the priest go it is finished and when he saw and heard that it is finished the the priest would on top of the uh, the temple would take the shofar and blow it so everybody in all everybody around could hear that this had been done and it had been accepted i mean that this had taken place inside this is passover this is not the atonement so now I just want to paint the picture for you because that doesn't sound like a big deal. But as Jesus was giving up the Spirit, he would have heard the trumpet of God's accepting, the sound of God accepting his sacrifice. Oh, See, it's yeah. stuff like that. You just And why was the veil ripped from top to bottom? Do you realize it in, in Jewish law, uh, it's just one of the expressions they have, but when a father uh, loses his firstborn son, and you know the stories in Scripture, he'll take his yeah. cloak and top rip to it bottom. top to bottom. And so what was the veil of the temple? It was, it was God ripping. It, it's in anguish. Son! And the bell of the temple was ripped from. And how do we know that? Because they were in there doing the sacrifices that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. They saw it. Whoa. See, this is all too cool. Just everything is just too cool. <laughs> but the, remember, all these things were done for examples for us. So in other words, you know, we, we we all have a past. Say amen to that. Yes. Amen. Everybody's got a past, and if you don't think you do, give me a couple minutes on, on the computer, and we can find your past. <laughs> okay. Everybody's got a past. But one of the things I try to encourage, if you want to live in the past, go further back. Don't 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 just just start with where you were born. Go back to where it says in the book of Ephesians that you were chosen to be holy and blameless before Him in love, before the foundations of the world. Go back to where it talks about those that were predestined and ordained to be called by God, to be formed in the image of Christ before the foundations of the world. Go back that far. Just don't stop with your mom and your daddy. Go back before Adam and Eve. It's like the third age. What? <laughs> I, said, I mean, when I when I saw that about the the priest and the horn and blowing the shofar, and, and, and I asked you, the, the shofar is God's voice to the Jewish people. It's, it's really a symbol of God's voice. Of the, and so Jesus hanging on the cross, he says, it is finished. He would have found time. He would have heard God's voice saying, statement of going sure. back, God already knew what day we were going to die before we were even born. Yeah. So, what we need to understand is that, that all these things happen for us so we can live in victory today. So our future won't be determined by our past. If we let the future, our future decisions, be determined by our past decisions, Instead of God's word, see we see we have a new opportunity every day to make a decision according to God's word. I was sharing with some young people uh, this last week, and hopefully, and I, th I think they caught it. Uh, we were talking about salvation, and in their understanding that salvation, yes, if if they believe in Jesus and what Jesus what Jesus has done at Calvary and the shedding of His blood. And confessing as Lord, that if they pass from this earth and the second coming hasn't come yet, and they pass from it, they're going to go to heaven. Uh, uh, yes, they understand that. 
But what I was explaining to them that salvation is much, much, much more, more and real than that. It's everyday living to a Jewish person. Salvation is every decision they make, they stop. I can't say the obvious, this, but they're trained to think, well, is this going to bring me life, light and increase, or death, darkness and decrease? Which is it going to bring? And so I, I put that, I, I was sharing that with these teenagers. This is our, if, if you don't do your homework, if you make a decision not to do your homework, is that going to bring you life, light, and increase, or death, darkness, and decrease? They went, oh, death, darkness, and decrease. Right. So you make a decision. See, salvation isn't about going somewhere. Salvation is how you live here. When you treat somebody at school, I said, when you treat somebody at school, you know, the way you treat them, is that going to bring you life, light, and increase, or death, darkness, and decrease? How's it going to, what's it going to do to them? Is it going to bring to them death, darkness, and decrease, or light, light, and increase? See, the way you treat people can bring to them death, darkness, and decrease, or life, light, and increase. Right, adults? Yeah, that's right. And so not only is it about us, remember what the scripture says, love one another as I have loved you. Do unto others as you have them to do unto you. If you want people to treat you and talk to you that's in a way that's going to bring you life, light, and increase, you need to speak to them when, with what? Life, light, and increase. Right. You're going to reap what you what? So. so. So if you're speaking death, darkness, and decrease, and they speak back to you in death, darkness, and decrease, hell is present on earth. See, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably easier for Christians to quit bringing hell to earth than it is to bring heaven to earth. If we just stop what we're doing negative, if, we're, if we just stop what we're bringing death, darkness, and decrease, that would be a step forward in bringing light, life, and increase. You understand what I'm saying? We're so, you know, I try to people, what can I do to bring life, life, and increase? Well, stop doing this. Yeah. Stop doing the opposite. You know, make it. Make, make, make your salvation real every day. Uh, we're, uh, this winter we're going to do a study, we're going to do a teaching on hell according to Jesus. Anybody interested in that? Sure. Anybody interested in Jesus, <laughs> what Jesus said about hell? Yeah. Not yeah. what you think about hell, not what you've been taught about hell, not what you think that someone else thinks that thinks what I'm going to talk about what Jesus what the Bible says Jesus said about the subject of hell and then we'll let you make your own conclusion because all of us have concepts of hell and the devil that have really been messed with medieval art medieval art Four Listen, we can't even get. Give me a little commercial. Medieval art was manifested because people couldn't read. And so people started drawing pictures and putting on plays. There's a real famous play called Dante's Inferno. And so they drew pictures to help explain what they thought Dante's Inferno play was supposed to be portraying. That was 1,400 years after Calvary. Before the first teaching of hell or Renaissance art took place. The King James Bible, does everybody know when the authorized version came out? 1611. 1611. King James Authorized Version. If you don't know that, you live there, I do. King James Authorized Version. <laughs> King, King, King James. I, I see a head shaking in the back. King James, the Authorized Version 1611, bless God. And it wasn't until then they actually took in the Old Testament uh, and, and decided they split them. You know, if a person was good, they're going to go up. If a person's bad, they're going to go down. But until then, everybody just went to the grave. Grave of four verse. Ashes to ashes. That was their concept. That was it.
It wasn't until he got around the Egyptians in bondage that he came across something called the afterlife. Oh, I got a quote for you from an Egyptian. You won't believe what it says. He almost thought he met Jesus. It's written down. It's history. I got it. The eternal you learning. that with us a few years ago. Yeah, we don't. We don't. I didn't have all of it. I got all of it now. <laughs> At least I think I did. I got it. Okay. So I just want you know, just to, I'm, not, I'm not trying to change what you believe about hell. Uh, I'm just going to tell you what, what Jesus said. Jesus mentioned the word hell 18 times. 15 meant one thing, 3 meant another. Got you thinking, don't I? Yes, Reggie. Back to this. <laughs> Go grab it one more. Ah, that's a misnomer. One didn't have to be white and black. But anyway. Can I ask a question? Back when um, when the cord went from red to white and the priest sat down oh. when it was finished. Everybody shouted. Now, is there any correlation to that when Jesus read the scripture today? This is prophecies coming no. when he sits down. No. That's a different reference. That's a different sitting down. Yeah, that's a different. And what I did, what I forgot to mention was when the priest sat down, 350,000 people would shout for long, I mean, they were jubilant. They would shout in jubilation. They would celebrate. They would dance. They would blow their shafars. They would holler and shout because they saw that God had, had accepted. They saw the miracle that God had accepted the sacrifice. Just not what happened on the inside, but they did a do-over. And I think that's what's missing in our church. There's a little bit of excitement. Yeah. Uh, to answer your question, Dan, uh, when Jesus sat down, when he read scripture, he sat down in a seat that never was set in before. It was actually, the, 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 it's called two things, the, the seat of Moses or the seat of the second Messiah. It's referred to as the seat of the Messiah. Uh, Moses was the first Messiah. You need to understand that. Moses was their Messiah out of bondage, and they were looking for another Messiah to bring them out of this bondage. They were expecting a new kingdom, a king with a kingdom that's going to physically manifest and drive the Romans out of their area. And Jesus sat down in the seat of Moses, and I tell you, that's right powerful. That's, that's the first thing he did to declare that he was the Messiah. It is. When he sat in that chair and said, today this scripture has been fulfilled and sat down, what's the scripture say? It didn't say that they're all eyes were on him and then he sat down. It said, he sat down and all eyes were on him. Because he was making a statement. I am, I am the Messiah. He just didn't declare it by what he, by the miracles he did, the four messianic miracles. He just didn't do it by the, uh, I mean, he did it by his actions, just sitting down. He fulfilled things that no one else had ever done. I think he did it more often than we understand. So, can, can, I, question, though. can I just say this one thing? I think we need to spend more time remembering when the enemy tries to bring our past back that it's been thrown off the cliff. Yep. Mm -hmm. Not dash <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going off that way. I'd grab one horn, one tail, and I'd go. <laughs> 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 we got to come up with a better picture. That's a good picture, though. Good clip. Hilarious. <laughs> but because yeah, yeah. the enemy, the enemy tries to bring stuff up to us all the time, and we just need to turn around and say, "Excuse me, that went off the cliff." Looks like you could fall off the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that gold in there comes. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this opportunity for us to gather together in this place. Holy Spirit, you're the great teacher. I thank you for the atonement, the, the reconciliation that has taken place, that we have been reconciled. Thank you, Jesus. You are
you've done on the inside. We thank you, Jesus. So we can walk it out on the outside. May we live different tomorrow than we did today. May we not live in regret. May we live in victory. May we live in reconciliation. You are a redeemer. We simply ask that you redeem our time. All God's people said, Amen. 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 Okay, would Noah be a kind of a Messiah because he did save the eight people? Yeah, he wasn't a Messiah. The, the, uh, no, he was not a Messiah. Some well, would say he brought bondage, but. No, he took them up. And actually, when you look in the scripture, there's 10 things. Uh, oh, one of the things that the number 10 represents, we haven't taught it here yet. We taught it at, at Burgess Falls, uh, the word barrel sheet. And uh, it's unfamiliar to you here, but we taught it at, well, there's some people that seen that on, that were watching. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, they are, that was impactful that night, I guess they, uh, the, the, yeah, that's the word barrel sheep in Paleo Hebrew. And in Isaiah 56, it says that he has declared the end from what? The beginning. The, beginning. the word beginning is barrel sheep. And actually, with sheep is the, the that's a head with a crown, is that word. This 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 beth is what that word is in Paleo Hebrew. Beth. beth. It's that literally the floor of a tent or a dwelling. Bet Resh Aleph Sheen Yod and, Paul. And that literally just means in beginning. And if I can put them together, it's bear a sheep. And in beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, remember Isaiah said that he's declared the end from the beginning. And one of these days, this winter, we'll take, put that back on, we'll. We'll take each one of those letters. Remember what this, you ever heard this, this statement, a picture's worth a thousand words? And so when you have six pictures, there's a lot of words in those six pictures that you, we don't even understand. What, but this is, how, this is how God communicated to his people. They, they could read this and understand. Okay, let, let me show you this real quickly. Uh, that that's a dwelling, but there's no you know. Well, who's in the dwelling? Who's in the dwelling? Well, you don't know, right? Unless you go to the next letter or the next picture, it looks like a a son or a prince or a king or somebody of authority. And we'll get into all this to show you how all the picture works. So it almost looks like you know what well, it's talking about a dwelling that a son was dwelling in. And, and matter of fact, those two letters together, that one and that one? Commercial for later. It means son. <laughs> you don't have to guess. It tells you what it means. And we're going to go through, and the next three, I mean, all, every combination of, of letters up there means a different word that all makes a sentence in a story. Wait a minute. Put that back up there. <laughs> I'm showing you the verse. No. No, no, no. Let's go back to the picture. This is what's really cool about this. What's that last letter? The cross. The cross didn't exist until the Romans invented the crucified people. But that was in the first word of the Bible. And actually, the, the actual engraving, when they, it actually, when it, it was engraved, Wood could be engraved at that time. It's just not, it, it, it's a wooden cross. Yeah, that's going to be fun there. This kind of stuff we're going to get into this winter. So, so and don't forget, right. we have this up here. You can come up here and look at this. You can't like at a public library, check it out, because you won't bring it back. What? So that is worth 
six thousand words right there. Then. Well, not six thousand <laughs> words, but uh, there's there's a story. Uh, what that tells you right there. The whole Bible is wrapped up. It's in the that end word. from the beginning. He told the end from the beginning in that very first word, beginning. And this is just the beginning. We didn't even get into the, Oh, that's right. You're still wanting to hear the rest of the story, right? Yeah, you? You, you didn't tell me. Oh, no, I'm not going to tell you. you got to come back to your house someday. 